All right, everyone. Uh, it, it, we have just begun. We have only begun. Do not, uh, do not go away. We have so much important stuff lined up. Um, I'll just, uh, for those who, who just are tuning in now or have no idea who you are or what we're doing, I'm Dr. John DeLynn. This is Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, today was a historic announcement where the, uh, the Mormon Church, uh, April 4th, 2019, uh, about three and a half years after its November 2015 policy where it made same-sex marriage an act of apostasy and uh, prohibited children of same-sex couples from baby blessings or baptism or priesthood unless when they turned 18 denounced their parents. That policy was rescinded today fully, I think. And uh, the internet, the Mormon internet is ablaze. Um, we have three panelists ready to join us right now. We are super excited to have them with us. Um, but before we do, I wanna make a request. There's 200, there are about 300 people right now joining us on Facebook Live. If 100 of you would share this stream right now on your Facebook pages, uh, I think we could make this video go viral. So if, you're, if, if you care about this issue, if you care about the Mormon Church, <clears throat> if you want to share a, a really constructive and healthy conversation right now, click on the share button and publicly share this uh, interview, this discussion on your walls with your friends and family and just say, hey, there's a really important discussion going on about today's announcement and changes with the Mormon Church. If 100 of you will make that uh, share, I think it will make a huge difference so please do that right now. Um, we have all sorts of really wonderful guests uh, who will be joining us later today, uh, including Natasha Alfred Parker, Mark Kriego, Anthony Miller, uh, Greg Prince. Uh, uh, we have a gentleman who was recently excommunicated for being in a same-sex marriage uh, with his partner who is active and faithful. He's gonna talk about his reactions um, we've got so much to cover, uh, but uh, right now we are super excited to continue uh, this interview with three members of the LGBT community uh, in one way or another, uh, and I am just so thrilled to have them with us. So what I'll do is I'll introduce e each one separately and I'll have them introduce themselves, but to begin, I am going to welcome Kimberly Anderson back to Mormon Stories Podcast. Those of you who, uh, Kimberly's been a longtime listener and participant. She also uh, was interviewed on Mormon Stories Podcast. It's, of course, one of my favorite interviews of all time. Uh, Kimberly Anderson, welcome back to Mormon Stories. John, thank you. You caught me at the end of my school day, frantically trying to finish out paperwork and photograph and upload documents for documentation. Uh, for the ending, for the ending chunk of a new master's degree in counseling psychology. So, but thanks for the the invitation to join you. This will be super fun. I'm super thrilled, and you were one of the first people I thought of. I we kind of organized this last minute, so I was just super thrilled that you were able to join us, Kimberly. Just get, do a thirty second uh, refresher to our listeners of you and and why this issue is so important to you. Oh, gosh. Uh, 30 seconds on me. Uh, a 50-year-old transgender woman. I uh, was married in the church for uh, 20 years to a lovely woman. Uh, we raised two fabulous children. They're in there. Uh, my daughter's 20. My son's 23. And uh, after, you know, 20 years of being married, uh, married, kind of decided I need to do something about my uh, issues of being transgender um, and uh, decided that I could no longer kind of repress this and started to transition kind of slowly, a slow burn in different areas of my life. Uh, my wife discovered that I was transitioning kind of everywhere except for in the home. Literally everywhere outside the home I had transitioned except for in the home. Um, that came to her uh, awareness and she decided to, uh, we decided to subsequently divorce. And uh, through that, uh, it kind of pushed me in a new direction to uh, engage the world as uh, hopefully finishing graduating in May as a marriage and family therapist with a degree from the University of San Francisco. Uh, I am a photographer for 30 years, uh, an educator for 10 years, and uh, my last project as a photographer was a thing called the Mama Dragon Story Project, which I'm very, very proud of, and those women are amazing, and I love them all. Beautiful. Well, it's so wonderful to have you, Kimberly, and we'll come right back with some questions. Uh, the, next, uh, the next panelist for this segment of our 
I don't know, four or five hour interview tonight is Johnny Walker. Johnny, I'm not sure you and I have ever met, but I'm sure uh, good friends with your brother, uh, Russ. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Johnny. Um, well, hopefully y'all can hear me. Um, it's a little bit soft if you can turn up the volume, but go ahead. Yeah, I'll just get a little closer here. So yeah, I, uh, I grew up LDS and from the uh, Central Point, Oregon area and um, was a missionary, did the whole, uh, you know, what's expected of you. I, I uh, went to BYU Idaho after that and um, through the grace of God made it out alive and um, left the church when I was, <laughs> can't really clasp our hands, yeah. Um, it's, it's, uh, 20, I was 24 when I left the church and, um, I officially resigned actually after the 2015 announcement that was made, I sent in my resignation letter and I thought, I don't want to be, a, I counted on the rolls with the church that would make policy such as this. But, um, uh, yeah, I just, um, I'm a businessman. I, I own a small insurance agency. I live in uh, Gladstone, Oregon now outside of Portland. And, um, but Kimberly, yeah. you're muted. Kimberly's talking. What were you saying, Kimberly? Okay. Keep going, Johnny. Oh yeah. So, um, I, yeah, I, I, I was married to a man for about uh, seven years. We divorced about, about um, a year and a half ago. And, uh, I don't, I don't see it, it's it, the, the further I get away from the church time wise, the, the less I feel connected to those roots. But, when something like this comes up, it, it, there's a, a boiling under my skin that it comes back. And, and I think about what I went through, what I saw others go through, what I hear about, uh, you know, stories like Kimberly's. Um, and I, I mean, just it, it I, I can't help but feel a super strong emotion. And so, yeah, I just wanted to give my voice a little bit tonight. But I don't, I don't know how much you want to know about me yet. <laughs> no, that's great. That's a great intro. Thanks for joining us, Johnny. We're really glad to have you. Thanks. All right. Our, our third guest tonight is Jill, Jill Bags. Jill, welcome to Mormon Stories. You'll have to unmute yourself, but uh, tell us how you fit into this equation. Okay, so um, I am the straight ex-wife of a, a gay man. We have four kids together. Um, we got married in our, in our early 20s, back when the church was telling gay men to marry women and it would make them straight. Um, he came out to me three years after we were married. We had two kids and we just decided that we would, would stick it out and we'd make it work and it would be okay. And uh, we stayed together for 18 years and just decided that we loved each other too much to watch each other suffer the way that we were and decided to just stop pretending that our best friendship was a marriage. And um, we got divorced three and a half years ago and we are still absolute best friends. Um, the, the, I left the church. We all left the church, our entire family, when the policy came out. Um, it was life shattering because it just suddenly made me realize the church was not true. And um, because our kids live mostly with him, we, they would have been directly affected by that. And that was, that was a hard, hard pill to swallow. So we left at that time and I was completely shocked today when, when this came out and so many people around me were celebrating that this was some great thing. And it just, it felt like a, you destroyed your life. Oh, just kidding. And that it's, it's been a rough day. Mm. Well, we'll jump right into that, Jill. So glad you could join us to represent the mixed faith, mixed orientation marriage uh, angle and the straight spouse angle as well. So let's just go back to each person. Kimberly, tell us how you heard and what your reaction, immediate reactions were today. Oh, today? Yeah. Uh, okay, so... Did you uh, see this coming? Did you have any, you know... You know, it's interesting. I'm like... Intelligence I'm that this was on the way? So I actually have, have started a really fun friendship with someone who gets lots and lots of leaked documents. And we were speaking last night about things that could be coming in this coming week. And this was not on either one of our radar. So I think it's rather remarkable that uh, this person that we all know and love didn't know about it. And I hadn't heard anything about it. 
the November 5th policy in 2015, I actually was not surprised about it. This rescinding of the policy, I actually am quite surprised by it. It, it caught me completely off guard. I've been trying to work with students here at my K through seven site today, and I have been largely unable to do anything because I've been busy um, putting out fires on the internet. It's been really a really crazy busy day. So I heard, I, where did I hear about this? I think I heard, must, must have heard about it on Exmo Reddit. That's where I hear all the good stuff. Okay. <laughs> and, and Kimberly, uh, can, you, can you just give us a brief, uh, you know, too often we, we don't talk about the, the T and the LGBT mm -hmm. appropriately. We don't, we aren't sensitive enough. We, we lump everything together. We mishandle that aspect. Can you just tell us a tiny bit about, uh, you know, what, what we forget or, or, you know, what this, what this, uh, what this situation, what this position is from a, from an, a, a transgender perspective that, that would help us be more thoughtful and sensitive to, to, uh, and not that you are the representative for the trans community, of course, but just from your perspective, what do we don't know? What do we, what do we forget? What are we missing, uh, when we talk about this issue, uh, from that perspective? Well, it is interesting. A lot of times we say LGBT plus or LGBTQ plus, uh, and a lot of times we just kind of lump all the letters into this one little pile, and we are really only talking about issues of sexuality, sexual attraction. Uh, transgender people, although we many of us have some form of sexual attraction to one gender or the other or any of them in between, uh, often our issues as trans people, gender creative people, we are not addressed uh, specifically, we just kind of lumped in there. Oh, I talk about the queer people, I talk about the LGBTQ people, but we're really only talking about issues of sexuality. And that kind of lends to this problem that we call trans erasure. And that can leave the transgender population uh, largely feeling forgotten, left out, um, not counted as worthy of conversation. And it can become a very, uh, can become a big problem, especially when individuals become, uh, they start to become like they feel like a burden. Uh, and when they, uh, when they feel like a burden, then that can lead to other issues as far as depression and anxiety and, and other um, you know, challenging situations. Uh, this particular announcement today, um, it does mention the word transgender, which is uh, remarkable. I think it might be the fourth or the fifth official time outside of handbook number one, where trans, the word transgender is actually published and used by the church. So that is a step forward. Um, the original November 5th policy in 2015 did not really mention uh, transgender individuals or issues of gender identity, uh, specifically in regards to their children. Uh, it was mostly regarding uh, gay individuals, people who were living in a, a committed or a, or a married gay relationship, their children were not be able to be blessed or baptized. Um, so really the, the original policy really, really didn't include transgender people. This policy today doesn't as well, because we're speaking about issues of sexual attraction and marriage specifically. Um, so the transgender person isn't um, part of that specific policy um, decision, um, but it is nice that the word transgender is being used because we're finally starting to include trans people in the discussion uh, at, the, at the highest levels of the church um, hierarchy. Uh, Dallin Oaks did say, I believe in 2016, that they are trying to figure out language and they have more instruction to do regarding transgender people. He did last October come down with some very harsh uh, rhetoric and basically told um, active LDS Mormons, or LDS people, sorry, uh, victory for Satan. Um, <laughs> he told the active LDS people to not uh, work for and to actively oppose things that would, or uh, policies, procedures, governmental laws, et cetera, whatever, cultural shifts that would normalize the transgender experience as well as gay marriage. So that uh, true believing Mormons have actually been put on notice by Dell and Shokes that you need to be opposing uh, gay marriage, transgender people. Um, I'm curious how the rest of the weekend is going to play out. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So tell us your emotional and intellectual re first reaction to this policy. Were you thrilled? Were you angry? What was your reaction? The policy today or the policy in uh, The announcement today. Uh, I was kind of surprised, quite frankly. Um, I had to go follow the link, as many people do with these things. We're not quite sure if it's real or not. The 2015 policy was counted as a hoax by many, many well-intentioned individuals. Um, so I had to go read the press release that was released by Mormon Newsroom. 
uh, to make sure that this was actually a real thing. And it was interesting to, to feel or to see that it was announced on a Thursday and the announcement came from uh, a training ship uh, uh, session that was held. I don't know that we've ever heard anything from Mormon News that regards training uh, national or local leaders. So that was interesting in that policy and procedure um, uh, method of how we receive this information. Much, as Kyle said earlier, much, much, much different than the leak from 2015. Right. Uh, emotionally, yeah, emotionally, intellectually, I was like, well, okay, let me read all the fine print, let me read the detail. And then it seemed like it took, it was like a control Z. It was like an undo of 2015. <laughs> I get that reference. <laughs> yeah, it was a control Z. Uh, in Photoshop, we you know, select all and we delete the palette and we're back to zero. Uh, unfortunately, I wear the initials of many individuals who have died by suicide since 2015. Uh, we don't get to bring those people back. Um, I reached out to the parents of one of those individuals today and gave them my most sincere love as they fight the good fight. We can't get those people back. I worked in Bogota, Colombia with Affirmation last year during the six months I was a vice president. I did a QPR suicide prevention training uh, with a bunch of wonderful, wonderful Colombian uh, members of the church. One of those individuals died by suicide in church on Sunday. We can't bring him back. In church? In church. Mm. Leonardo's gone now. I worked with him in that suicide training. Uh, these deaths are real. The impact is tremendous. The trauma, the, uh, the, the fallout from these things cannot be underestimated. It is real. Uh, there is no price that we can put on these people's heads that we have lost to deaths by suicide. Uh, and as Jill said, there's no way that we can bring back the destroyed marriages, the destroyed relationships, the relationships with our children, the relationships with our former spouses, with our parents, with our siblings. There is a lot of fallout because of this policy that is really, really uh, completely damaging, completely destructive to people's lives, my life included. When I heard the announcement this morning, I was speaking to a friend of mine who was recently excommunicated because she got married to her partner. And we were talking this morning, she was really um, excited to hear that there was a procedure to appeal her excommunication. She asked me if I could find that information. And so I found a, a talk by um, Elder Ballard. Uh, there was a conference report of 1990 uh, that talked about how and what the process is to appeal your excommunication. So I sent that to her and it will be interesting to see what she decides to do over the next few months. Yeah, how, how, does this, uh... Uh, in addition to your advocacy work, your friendships, how did how does this or did this or does this affect you personally, or does it? That's a great question. I mean, we're in this what, twelve hours, maybe ten hours, maybe. Uh, none of my family has reached out. My children have not reached out. My ex-wife has not reached out. Uh, in fact, I've had relatively few people reach out to me, uh, and that's fine. I don't expect people to reach out to me. I'm one of the people that does the reaching out now. Uh, and I'm comfortable with that role and with that slot. Fortunately, I spent last weekend hunkered down in a really intensive weekend of self-care, um, trying to prepare myself for the upcoming three days uh, where I will be called on to ask and help a lot of other people. So uh, how does it affect me personally? Well, uh, with my family relationships, I'm not sure how that will play out uh, professionally and personally with my uh, friendship relationships. This next weekend is probably going to be pretty rough. Does it change your feelings about the church in any way, positive or negative? Uh, no, not at all. Okay. All right. Thanks for that intro, Jill. Let's bring you on. You, you, your, your reactions as the, as the ex-wife of a of a mixed orientation marriage. You, you did not have a happy, fun reaction. Yours seemed quite hurtful. Can you talk to us about when you heard, how you heard, and and what it felt like for you? Yeah, so I actually uh, heard about it at work. People were knew my story and were you know excited to to share this and isn't this great news kind of a thing. And so these are believers that were thinking you would be happy. Yeah, yeah. You're um, here in Utah, because, right? You work here in Utah. Yeah. Okay. And and I did get you know in in sharing my story, there were some people that would say you know well this doesn't affect you. Why are you losing your faith? You know if your ex husband's the one who's gay and you're, you know it. It, it just seemed like such a strange question to me. Um, and, and hearing the news today was, was upsetting to me because it, it just, 
like Kimberly was saying, it it's these things can't be repaired, and the damage that has been done to to families and to the youth and the suicides and all of that isn't something that can be that can be fixed. And what I feel like the damage. What can you tell us about the damage done in your life and in your family's life? Not to, uh, you know, not to sensationalize anything, not to make you a specimen, but just to help people know the the boots on the ground impact of the church's past policies. Well, I think it it, it started back when 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 my ex husband and I got married. That that was the you know if if someone came out as gay, it was you marry a woman and and that's what you're supposed to do and you know, we did, we did seek counseling and we went to LDS social services and they said, no, 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 you, you stick it out and you, you make it work and, and it'll be fine. Just have faith. And I think over the, the course of our marriage, it just doing our best, it just, it wasn't enough. Um, so then to decide that we want each other to be happy and, and be better people for our children, when that policy came out, it was like the church had created these families and now they're kicking them out. And that was just extremely, extremely hurtful to us. And the fallout from, you know, my believing family members, from his believing family members, um, it did create, create a divide there. I think that overall, you know, our four kids are, are teenagers now. And I think overall, you know, us having left the church was a really, really good thing. We're, we're doing great and, and happy and healthy and better. Um, I think that the reversal today on the policy was, absolutely shocking and it was it was upsetting to me on a personal level just feeling like the church is is really 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 not true in um how could it be revelation you know back when they said they were protecting children you know this was the reason for the policy in the first place was because we care about kids and we want to protect kids from this conflict they're going to have at home so are they now saying they don't care about kids now it it, it just seems like the the things that they're saying and the excuses they're giving just just aren't holding up and that and that's upsetting and i think the thing that's upsetting me is that people i care about are are believing it and and that's a tough thing what what would you hope the reaction would be from the believing family and friends well i would hope on a on a selfish level that they would see that this this can't possibly be revelation that if god is unchanging he certainly can't be, you know, wishy-washy and, and changing, changing his mind so quickly like this. I just, I don't, I don't believe that. I think I was, you know, taught my whole life that, you know, God doesn't change and the church doesn't bow to social pressure. And this is exactly what is happening right now. So, you know, I would hope that they would, they would give a huh to, to this new thing today. So in, in your hopes, this would, this would sort of awaken up members to, to see that maybe um, the church isn't what they thought. Is that what you're saying or not? Yeah. 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 How, how is your, uh, how is your ex-husband taking it? How are your kids taking it? Did they know? Um, yeah, I called, I called him pretty immediately. He hadn't heard about it yet. And uh, he had a very logical response. He said, of course the church has to do this. They've got to keep their, their public image up and this was really damaging to the church the policy in the first place so turning it around was something they had to do i don't think he was having quite the emotional reaction i was having of um just feeling like you know my life was torn apart by the first policy and now they're saying just kidding and not taking responsibility for any of the damage that was done um uh yeah i, I talked to one of my daughters today and uh, she hadn't heard about it either and she just said yep that makes sense I think I think of, of all of the six of us, I'm I'm probably the one having the biggest the biggest issue with it. For sure. Real quickly, and and I, I hope you're okay with this. Like, paint for have you in your mind had these moments where you thought about what how your life would have been different if you had not been encouraged to marry a, a gay man. And what what you know, it's sort of that Les Miserables moment. I had a dream in my life could be so different from the hell I'm, I've lived. Yeah. Can you talk to us about how things might have been different and what, what you feel like you've lost because of what opportunities you and your husband have lost and your children and what the, what the real consequences have been for you guys? Um, so I'm, I'm now in a, in a heterosexual relationship with, with the love of my life. And I feel like there are times where I think if, if we had 
the family and all of that. I, I get it. I get it now. I get what that relationship is supposed to be like. And uh, my ex-husband just, just recently started dating someone and, and watching him have romantic feelings awaken that he's never had before is, is, is something new for him too. And I think your question is, is a complicated one only in that, you know, can any parent say they wish they you know, they had, had made different choices and, and not had their, their kids. Um, he is the most amazing father that I've ever, ever seen in the world. And I ask myself, would I want anyone else to be, you know, the parent of my children? No, I, I wouldn't. Um, yeah, your husband, you both are amazing people. I've, I've hung out with you and <laughs> You're both beautiful, brilliant, amazing people. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, so I think that's a complicated question. I think that it's hard to say what would be different and if things would um, have been better or, or worse had we not been in this situation. We definitely, you know, I get asked a lot if I'm bitter and, and angry that I, you know, spent 18 years, you know, with a gay man and, and all of the, the emotional and, you know, psychological stuff that goes along with that. But I really just feel like we were both victims, really victims of, of the church and its teachings and what we were told was the right thing and how we were going to make it to the celestial kingdom and have eternal life. I, I feel like we, we were just both victims and I don't know how things would be different, but I do wonder that. Yeah. Sure. All right. Well, thanks for giving us your initial reaction. Uh, it's, uh, it's heartbreaking and it's real. So thank you. Johnny, let's bring you on. Uh, now you, you went, so how many years ago did you kind of stop attending or believing in the church? Um, 20, or no, uh, yeah, 2006. Yeah, so you've been out 13 years. That's, that's interesting. So yeah. what's, what's it like from, the, from your perspective of having been out for so long, moved on, <laughs> thriving, you know, uh, what, what was your reaction today? When did you hear? How did you hear? And what was your reaction? Well, I, I hear from Russ, my brother, I mean, and my family. There's seven kids and, and uh, six of us have pretty much left the church. Um, and my parents are still active and I have one brother who is active as well and his family. So, we, you know, we text each other all day. You know, there's a group text and, and Russ told us and I was like, what? It, it, it was so confusing at first because that was just three and a half years ago that they did that, it, right? It was in November of 2015. So it didn't make sense to me. I, I thought, what happened? That was my first thought. Like, what, what happened to cause this, like, uh, you know, new revelation? That's always my thought. Like, okay, so, you know, was it that uh, BYU not getting invited to the, the football games? that caused the 78 revelation, right? Or uh, getting kicked out of the, the, the back the conference they were in. I, you know, I mean, who knows? But it, that, that was my first reaction. Like, what? What, what caused this? Um, and, and then we were chatting and I, I, it makes me mad. It makes me really mad. And I don't get mad about the church often anymore. I got way past that. But then stuff like this comes up and I just go, man. So this made you mad. Why did it make you mad since you've happily moved on? Well, cause, cause it brings me back and I don't like, it brings that emotion in again and I've moved on. I don't think about it uh, very often. And then when I have to think about it and I'm forced to confront the bull that I went through and, and the forced reparative therapy counseling at BYU, Idaho and, the friends that I saw suffer, the, the people that lost their lives. When I get confronted with that, I, it angers me. It angers me. I mean, not to the point where like I'm, you know, ready to hurt someone or anything. I just, it, it, it's frustrating. I don't know what to do with that energy sometimes. So I, I like, I, you know, I do volunteerism at, at a couple of different organizations up here in the Portland area. And, um, I try to get that energy out in other ways, you know, um, but it, it, it's frustrating because I've never really, I never felt like I belonged in, I mean, I, I, I follow a little bit the Mormon stories community or, or the, the Exmo Reddit, like I, that's great group there, but, um, I never really felt like I belonged in the former Mormon 
gay man community. I, when I, I came out, I, I left BYU, Idaho, and I moved to Reno, Nevada. And I lived there for about a year. And that's where I started like, you know, coming out and experiencing dating and all that stuff. And I was so disenchanted with what I saw in the gay community that I thought, man, I'll never relate to any of these people. Cause I was still in that mode, you know, like the, the missionary, ex-missionary mode, uh, return missionary mode. So I moved to Utah and it was like, okay, I'll meet someone out there. And that was a terrible mistake because it, wherever you go, there you are. It wasn't in them or the people around me. It was me. And so it took me years to kind of work on, work on that. And, you know, eventually I, I, I feel like I'm in a great place with the church. Uh, honestly, I, I, I have love for the people that go that believe like my folks and, and other, you know, very kind people that are sweet and loving to others. And then you have this like total disconnect in the leadership of the church. And I look at policies like the 2015 and then this new, Oh wait, just kidding. Like Jill was saying, Nope, just kidding. Uh, it, it, it that to me, it's, it's, it's so intentional. It's so intentional. And they, they have to know that they hurt people. They have to. I mean, when, when, when I wrote my resignation letter, who reads that? Do they, they, <laughs> you know, if, do they get reports that these people are upset and uh, hurting, you know, like, uh, it just didn't make any, doesn't make any sense. That was my reaction today. I thought it did not make sense. And then then it's kind of was like, oh, well, maybe it's the money. Maybe it's the tenants dropping and the ward shrinking. And maybe it's saving face. Maybe there's something coming out in the news here in the next cycle or two that's that they're going to be able to get ahead of. You know, maybe there's a scandal we don't know about. That <laughs> There's a lot of maybes of the reasoning for this today. Well, thank you so much for sharing your perspective. I mean, the research that I did on the LGBT community back from my PhD dissertation, where we interviewed, surveyed 1,635 Mormons and post-Mormons, two thirds of my respondents had left the church completely at the time of the survey. So you represent a very large portion of, uh, you know, of historical LGBTQ Mormons that just left mm -hmm. and uh, left a long time ago. And uh, so it's really, really valuable to have your perspective. Okay, so for panelists, I, of course, have a bunch of questions and, and, and thoughts, but I, I want to ask you all right now to just start thinking about topics or questions or issues or reactions that I am not aware enough to bring up or that are really on your mind. I want this to be, at least for the next 20 minutes, just sort of an open discussion of things you guys want to talk about. So um, I'm going to unmute you, Kimberly, if I can. No, it won't let me. But uh, are, are there any topics or issues or questions that you guys want to bring up? Or do you want me to just uh, throw in some questions? Kimberly. Well, I actually was thinking about this earlier today. Um, and I posted on my Facebook page. I don't like to make public predictions, but I'm going to make this one. I'm just going to read this from my phone from my Facebook page. I say prediction. Right. Today's announcement from the LDS Church will buy them just enough grace with just the right people that they will pass the conversion therapy bill in just the right way that they want to. Oh. Second prediction, transgender people will be thrown under the bus in the special session. I think this is a PR ploy. I mm -hmm. think this is nothing but politics and they're trying to buy favor, curry favor with legislatures and queer people in Utah so that they can pass the, the, gen, or the uh, gay conversion therapy bill. And Johnny, I'm sorry that this triggers or activates you. I didn't know that you were, that you did a reparative therapy at BYU Idaho. I'm so sorry that that happened to you. But I think that's what this is about. I think this is about uh, greasing the skids for the special session later on this year. So you see, poli me. see political, go ahead, Johnny. I, and that doesn't, uh, thank you for sharing that, Kimberly. That doesn't surprise me that, that there's a, a reparative therapy bill uh, in Utah happening. There was, and then it got, oh. uh, it was altered so much that the original sponsor of the bill withdrew it because he didn't recognize it anymore. He couldn't support it. Wow. Yeah. That, see, and that was, uh, 
my sixth sense today. What what's happening or what caused this? And then what's going to happen that they're getting ahead of? Because that this always that's always why these things come out, right? Um, thank you for sharing that. I'm gonna have to look into that. Whew. <laughs> And you know, don't worry about the, the triggers. I I've um, I talked at length about my experiences at, with my yeah what I went through, and I'm I'm an open book about that. You know, um, the 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 more I talked about it, and the more I get to talk about it, mm. the better it is to me right. and, and what I went through. So, so Kimberly, you're thinking political motives. Well, I think that's one of the At least partly. Uh, perceived yeah. benefits the church is going to have from this. Yeah, I don't see the church making any of these big announcements without some sort of a, uh, secondary or, or tertiary gain. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so, Jill, you raised your hand. What do you want to bring up? So, um, I kind of, it seemed a little bit like it was, there were some, some loopholes in there where it just, it still does not give hope to LGBT people in the church. So we, if, if you're married, we won't recognize you're married, your marriage. So if you are, you know, having normal relations, you are going to be seen as, as having premarital sex and you're gonna be kicked out and excommunicated anyway. So it, it seems like for the LGBTQ people that not much has changed except for the label of apostasy. I think it's good that they're, that they're not punishing the kids for that. Um, but I also, and I also hope it, this makes a, a difference for how families treat their LGBT kids, kids in those families. But I also don't think this is giving any more hope to hope for happiness for, for the youth or the kids in there. So that discuss, I guess that that's just, that's just what I was thinking. Yeah. And, and Kimberly, I want you in on this as well. Like certainly is, is it true that one, uh, undeniable benefit of this change will be a reduction in LGBT youth suicides. Is it that unambiguous or not? Well, it's hard to make a claim like that without research to support it. Intellectually, I don't know that I can make a statement like that. Emotionally, I certainly think it will do, uh, it will help. Yeah, my gut tells me that, that it can't hurt. Uh, well, actually, then maybe not. I'm curious, I actually, I wonder about this now because what we're finding out, well, from a lot of people, myself included, we're now questioning the very nature of God and revelation. And so I wonder if this will kind of usher in some existential crisis for a lot of people, queer people included. Mm. So I don't know uh, if it will reduce suicides um, as well or as much as we kind of might want to make a claim to. I hope it will help. Uh, certainly, uh, now as a clinician and a researcher, I, I don't know that I can make a statement like that without data to back it up. Of course, we're all speculating, but yes, absolutely. Yeah, and I didn't mean to say any of us can know any of these, the answers to any of these questions. Yeah, my crystal ball is in the back room and it's broken. Um, <laughs> but yeah. I think I, I do. I do know though that in the wake, in the tumultuous wake of the 2015 policy we did see people die by suicide. And they left messages, documented messages that talked about why they, why they died by suicide. So in the recanting and the stepping back and the U-turn here, um, I wanna think it will help. I want to be optimistic that it will help. Uh, time will tell. Uh, and, and we're early in this weekend. A lot of things can happen between now and Sunday night. That can be equally damaging, if not more so, to the queer community and the ally community as well. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying that it's we don't know, but it's possible that the uh, that the the gains of this no longer you know same sex marriage being declared as apostasy, right. of you know children not being excluded, that sort of thing. Could for for LGBT youth and adults could be offset by by the fact that it could throw many believing LGBT Mormons into a faith crisis that right. could also be very painful. Well, and Jill kind of spoke to this before. You know, there's a lot of damage that's kind of swirling around this, and um, right. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, time will tell. Yeah. One of the you know I remember when 
the church came out with the Mormon and gays website, mm -hmm. so many Mormons reaction, Orthodox Mormons reactions was, Oh, look, the church is good with the gays now. Right. As if they had done something that was really just so compassionate, loving and remarkable. Uh, there, there is sometimes that simplicity mindset where it's just like, Oh, LGBT church says something kind. Oh, we're good now. And, and that's a, that's a negative risk of this sort of thing. Is it, 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 it does take pressure off the church, makes them look like they've done something compassionate. And a lot of the urgency that was built up by the encircle house, by love loud, by, by the movie believer with Dan Reynolds and, and all the activism and Mormons building bridges and all that, all of a sudden, to a lot of members, it's like, oh, okay, I can check that box. The church is good with the gays now. What do you guys think about that? Hmm. <laughs> it's absurd. <laughs> well, it's absurd just... meaning that's not what's going to happen? Or yeah, it's absurd no, that that would be man. people's reaction? I mean, I'm very skeptical. I'm very skeptical that the church will ever come around when it comes to fully accepting uh the spectrum of LGBTQ into the fold. How does that fit into the plan of salvation? I mean, ultimately, that's what they have to address. And the church has never addressed that. They've never addressed the doctrinal basis on how gay people, transgender people, queer people fit into the, the plan of salvation. It was never covered by Joseph Smith or Brigham Young or the myriad of other prophets. It's not addressed in the Bible. So they have to invent a doctrine and so far they are failing and it's it's sad because in their process of failing they are hurting people yeah you know i i remember lots of people made the observations that sort of more modern mormonism hangs its hat on prophet seers revelators and 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 you know ongoing revelation on the one hand but then a, a student of Mormon history would look back over the century and a half and say, where, since Joseph Smith died, where's the prophecy? Where's the seeing? Where's the revelation? The, there's the consistent reflection since the 60s that the church is always 10 to 15 to 20 years late on every major civil rights initiative, whether it's you know civil rights for people of color, whether it's the ERA and women, or now whether it's the LGBT stuff and there are other issues as well, environmentalism, whatever. Um, so in many, for many years, I personally, and many others have kind of goaded church leadership into sort of where's the, where's the prophecy? Where's the revelation? Yeah. Where's the beef? Where's you know? the beef? <laughs> um, so John, that's interesting because when we did the Mormon stories, uh, the mama dragons thing at um, in Salt Lake city at the club, you know, I stood up in the, and I made a pretty bold, I, I called a, uh, Dallin Oaks out and I said come on man where's the where's the stuff where is it gonna where, where's it coming from we need some stuff from you yeah and what's interesting to me about that is that is that with all this flurry you know with with Monson there was nothing you know other than the uh, prop 8 and and then the awesome. November 15 policy but with Nelson it's been this just frenetic flurry of policy changes that I, that I know is being interpreted by Orthodox believing Mormons. It's just this, this waterfall, this hurricane of, of the, the heavens, the windows of heaven being opened and revelations pouring forth. Well, let's be, let's be real though. Honestly, come on. Yeah. When we were younger, let's think about this in our late teens, early 20s we're dating we're thinking about you know starting a family and it's the year 2000 is just around the corner and we have this idea that we're part of the true church and we have revelation and we have these books and these things and this then a sealed portion and there's a cave in uh uh Kimura that's got more records and we're stoked we are stoked to be part of this awesome thing we're part of the chosen generation yeah we we got all this stuff that's like primed us to be ready for all more and more and more. We didn't get it when we were in our 20s and 30s. Now the, the people in the church today are getting it. I am certain mm -hmm. that they're seeing this as, yeah, this is awesome stuff. Here we go. We're, 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 we got the bus fired up and we're off to the races now. We got people in the back and we got the barbecue cooking and we got ice in the cooler. And we got Cokes on tap now that we can have Coke at BYU. Um, but I think, yeah, the true believing Mormon, 
let's be honest. We all were there. Uh, I don't know Jill that well. She may still be there. I don't know. Oh, wait. So you, you, I'm sorry. You said you resigned from the church. I'm sorry about that. But we were excited for this kind of stuff. We were stoked for the prophet to be like, oh, yeah, and this week, and this week, and this week. And yeah, let's go. Let's keep it going. Continuing Revelation, Article of Faith 9. We were down for all that. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure now. What do you mean? Uh, well, many of us have decided that the church is a fraud. Right. Many of us have decided that the church misled us. Many, is, many of us have come to the conclusion that the personal revelation that we were entitled to from God can completely contradicts what we were told from the pulpit, what we were told by our parents, what we were told from our, our bishops and our state presidents and our patriarchs. We've relied on a personal revelation that we were taught to use by the church, and we're finding out that the church isn't exactly what it, called, what it, what it claimed itself to be. So, so we're part of a wave kind of out and deciding and looking back with some historical uh, clarity, with some new documentation and some searchability with the internet, of course, we're deciding that maybe this thing that we were so invested in isn't exactly what we thought it was going to be. Jill spoke to the checklist of things that she tried to do to reclaim her marriage, uh, to get to the celestial kingdom, I'm assuming. Uh, I tried to do that myself with my own marriage. I went through the actions and the motions for years and years and years. We did the things we were told to do. Uh, I, I think that the, the true believing Mormon sees these things coming from President Nelson, and they're stoked. Um, I think it's easy for them in the excitement to overlook the pain and the deaths and the, the collateral damage that the church is just willing to, to brush under the rug. Oh, marriages are gone. No big deal. People are dead. No big deal. Families are shattered. No big deal. It'll work itself out in the eternities. And speaking of plan of salvation, Johnny brings up a great point. And I do not want to steal Greg Prince's thunder, but I have a quote in his upcoming book that talks about the plan of salvation and the church's inability to address that regarding queer individuals and specifically transgender and particularly true for intersex people. And it all falls apart when the plan of salvation has to confront and fit in queer people that are real, that are legitimate, that isn't a fabrication. We exist, we, we fit into a normal uh, existence on, the, on this mortal's coil. The Mormon church has no explanation for how we fit into it in the plan of salvation. It all completely falls apart. They, they haven't even come out with that, that bullshit line story where, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> where they, it was like, if you're not married and in the temple, you'll be um, like a ministering angel. Remember that? So if you're single and, and you never get married, you can still go through the temple. Or, uh, that was taught to me as a kid. We don't, need, we don't even get that. We don't even get to be like ministering angels. That hasn't even been part of this like canonized doctrine of plan of salvation. So, I mean, we didn't get that. Yeah. Yeah. So on the one hand, we oh, all want to see change, positive change. And in addition, um, you know, we, we've all been wanting to see the prophets prophesy and reveal and revel and, and you know, and, uh, whatever, prophesy, see, and, and reveal. And then we have to admit that there have been a lot of changes. And many of them are just very positive. Um, and, and many of them are, are basically moving things in the right direction. But then you have to ask, number one, do policy changes count as revelation? And does a policy change that just undoes not not only something that was you know opposite of what the, what the new policy change is but that also is extremely damaging without a without an apology how much positive credit do the brethren get for that right um so i think that with uh a lot of people were saying you know the, the gospel is different from the policies and the policies of the church about and then now we're pants or, you know, whatever those are that they're separate from revelation. I, I had a lot of conversations with people about that, but the difference with this policy was that this affected people's saving ordinances. All the things they taught were essential that they were, they were denying children these things that they were saying were essential. So that seemed to directly conflict with the gospel. It wasn't just a policy. Um, Something I found interesting back in 2015 was that when I told people about the policy, a lot of people had not heard about it. 
um, they were surprised by it because it was something that was kind of slid in under and was not this major announcement. Um, and then when they were, you know, they saw the video of the explanation for why, you know, the protection of children and, and all of that, they said, oh, okay, now that makes sense. So I, I do wonder, you know, what we were just saying about, is this going to maybe cause a faith crisis with people? You know, my hope is that people would question a little bit more now that they have seen this switch around. Um, I just wonder if more people are now going to be aware that the policy even existed than initially when the policy came out. Yeah. Well, we've got about five minutes before we bring on our, our next guest, who I'm really excited to bring on. And you guys are welcome to stay. Uh, we're going to be bringing on um, a, a member of the Mormon LGBT community, the believing Mormon LGBT community, who was recently excommunicated just in the past few weeks for marrying his partner um, as they were faithfully attending church. I'm really excited to, uh, to bring him on. But what do, you guys, what do you guys want to talk about in our last four minutes? What else do you guys want to bring up? Uh, or I can ask uh, some questions. Um, I think have any of your to... have any of your true believing family reached out at all? Uh, yeah, I I I do want to say that um, that my mom sent me a text this morning and she said, "Did you see the policy?" And she's you know true believing active. She said, "This just seems to make things worse." And so I your true was... believing mom said. Yeah, yeah. And I thought that was a really interesting reaction. I had a conversation with her today about it. And, and she said, we're on the same page. A lot of people, I also have a gay brother. So she has a, um, a gay son as well. Um, a lot of people were messaging her, isn't this great news? And even as a true believer, she had the, no, th th this is not great news. This is, yeah. this is upsetting. And this is disturbing. And, and we had a pretty long conversation where we had a lot of solidarity and how we how we felt about it and our reaction to it. So I was I was really really surprised by that. Yeah, there is a there is a backlash or backfire kind of thing that could happen, like with the with the church's essays, the gospel topics essays. Yeah. Even though they were introduced with the intent of helping people not lose their faith, for many people, the gospel topics essays was the impetus, were the impetus to their faith crisis. So, right. uh, Johnny or Kimberly, do you guys want to talk about a potential back backlash or? Uh, unforeseen negative impact to, to true believing members faiths? Well, I'll speak from, uh, if I can, just quickly, I am super kind of hopeful that this will, you know, cause my children to examine the things that they've been taught at church and largely by me too. I have to confess I had a part in this. I taught them, you know, raised them in the gospel, but my path is veered away from the church. And I think that there might be some unanswered questions that they may have that this policy may you know, force them to confront and maybe use some of the critical thinking skills that we taught them as children and young adults and come to come to some conclusions that maybe, uh, you know, what they think and what they've been taught about me is wrong. That's what I am encouraged by. And, and that, that's tough because I think as mental health professionals and as humans, we take seriously this ethical obligation to be affirming of people's, you know, religious and cultural beliefs. And I'm sure Kimberly, you feel as passionately as I do about on the one hand, never trying to deconstruct anyone's faith or cause them to doubt or take them away because faith is sacred. I'm sure that's how you would treat your clients, but when it's your own kids and you feel like religion has come between you in some way and your kids, that, that makes it more difficult when it's personal and when it's family. Is that right? Well, I would just say that I kind of have an unspoken agreement with my children that we don't talk about things that are in, that are that are of the church. Uh, when we were getting divorced, I told my wife, and she actually asked me not to talk about the things that I'm learning about the church. And I said, okay. And so I have never done that. I did say to her, though, that when they come to me with questions, I will be as open and transparent, and I will tell them everything that I know and everything that I believe. So I can only anticipate and hope that, you know, they will kind of turn a corner and they will approach me on their own. And you're absolutely right. I can't dictate for them the path of their life. Only they can do that. Uh, even as passionate as I'm about the new path that my life has taken, I cannot dictate for them their, their, own, their own path. So yeah, they, they have to make those choices on their own. And I would say that, was true, that would be true of any active and true believing Mormon. They have to make their own decisions here. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, as we, as we sort of bring this segment to the close, and again, I want to keep 
invite you guys all to stay on as we continue this discussion. As we jump in, we're going to have moments where we bring people on and then moments where we just have panels who can just keep discussing. Jill, what, what final thoughts would you want to share? Conclusions, perspectives, what would you want to share as we thank you so much for joining us tonight? Well, as, as someone who was, was completely 100% all in because it was true for, you know, 41 years of my life to, to have it all fall apart and, and watch this church that I, you know, believed completely in. It, it was how I made sense of the world. It was how I defined myself to see this floundering and these things, these inconsistencies and things happening. It's, it's, it's been just very, very eye-opening to me. Um, I felt like with the first policy, they drew a line in the sand and it was like, you either choose the church or you choose your, your ex-husband and kids. And um, I can just say that, that my family and I are, are in the best place we've ever been. And the gift of the faith crisis was a definite gift for us. And um, I'm glad they're there, but I'm, I'm sad to see the, the floundering in the church that's happening. All right, Jill, well, you're lovely. Your, uh, your family's lovely. I'm so happy that you guys are finding joy and I can't thank you enough for coming on Mormon Stories. It's a real thrill to have you. you bet. Thanks for having me. Johnny, what are your what what final words would you like to share with us? Oh, uh, I just I, I I'd hope that that this uh, thing that happened today um, helps those that are questioning open their eyes and break out of that cognitive dissonance that traps them. Uh, I also really, really hope that um, those that were hurt by the 2015 event, right, the 2015 proclamation or uh, revelation, um, and those that have been hurt by the damaging policies and, and practices, um, I hope that this doesn't harm them more. And I also, I really hope that the kids struggling um, today, the way I did, whether they're young or in college at one of the church colleges or elsewhere, man, I just, I hope that they're all right because I've been there. If you're listening to this, you can do it. You can make it through. And it is so awesome on the other end. Believe me, life is worth living. Life is worth every minute breathing and, and hoping and, and there's awesome people out there for you to love and that will love you back. Friends, family, make your own. You can do it. I hope that this doesn't hurt them. Well, Johnny, it's just such a delight to have you on. Shout out to your, your brother, Russ, one of my dearest friends on the planet. <laughs> so glad I could meet you this way and yeah. Russ told me about you for years. So yeah. it's such a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. You can call me or, or message me anytime. All right. Kimberly, you want to bring us home for this segment? <laughs> That's quite a responsibility. Uh, you know, I would just echo everything that Jill said and Johnny said. I, I, I tend to take up a lot of space and I don't want to take up any more. Uh, you've got a lot, of more, a, lot more, a lot of people coming on uh, soon and I want to just kind of, you know, usher them in and, and tell them thank you for taking their time. I'll be listening all night long uh, to what this discussion is. So thank you, John, for having me on uh, for another chance to say a few things here and there. And uh, Johnny, it's been f fabulous getting to know you. And Jill, I am actually super disappointed that you're a straight woman because you're super cute. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I don't well, know if that takes us home or not, but that's that's my two we're cents. Home. He is we're super home. cute. All of you guys <laughs> are home. super cute. We're almost in the bedroom. We're still home. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm, <kidding. laughs> I'm still at school. <laughs> All right, Kimberly, Jill, Johnny, love you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll see you guys soon. Feel free to stay on if you feel like it. <laughs>